TCU for a tough test. And it was a tough test. Cal fell 32, 34. It was a very entertaining game. I mean, I have to say myself, um, it was on, I believe, ESPN, you, and maybe there was some sort of a national audience. I don't know. It's pretty rare for Cal games. But objective neutral fans probably got a game they loved. Us, on the other hand, another very frustrating loss. Cal held the lead early and saw it fade very quickly. Um, Will, what were your first takes from that game? Because one thing that has defined Cal over the past few years, honestly, the entire Justin Wilcox era has been the defense carrying the load and the offense lagging behind. And this game against TCU felt like the complete opposite. Yeah, no, and that, that that was what was so strange about it. After that, after that Nevada, um, after that first Nevada game, um, it looked as though the defense would be, like you said, carrying this team throughout the season, um, and that the offense had some catching up to do. Um, but right from the get go, it was like Cal's offense was on. Um, shocked me, um, and uh, you know, I was watching with all the other daily Cal writers and. We were just kind of – we kept looking up, and Trayvon Clark is like, you know, first we scored that first touchdown, like a couple 50-yard passes very early yeah. on. Um, and I thought, you know, okay, this could end up being a blowout. Cal could realistically score 28 in the first half, um, you know, just put TCU out of the game early. Um, and we know how that, how that went down. Um, but to answer the question, why can't Cal hold the lead? Um I, in my opinion, fatigue. Uh, I, I don't think the coaching staff um, would admit that it was fatigue. Um, they certainly didn't in, in the post game in the, in the press conference afterwards. Um, but TCU dominated time of possession. I think they had 13 more minutes um, than Cal uh, in time of possession. Um, also, like 90 something degrees outside. That too, and and yeah, obviously, you know the other. The other writers were bringing up that fact and saying, you know, was it the heat? Was that getting to you? And and Wilcox, you know, refuses to make excuses. Um, he wasn't going to make that excuse, but it could have also been that too, for sure. Yeah, I thought um, the tackling was just horrible, and that's been kind of a theme uh, for Cal over the past couple seasons in the run game, especially um, bringing down ball carriers is always tough for Cal, but again, Zach Evans, a guy who was a five-star recruit at TCU's only five-star recruit in history, it was very tough. He absolutely tore up the Cal defense. He had 204 total yards plus a touchdown, and he was just killing Cal every time he had the ball. It seemed like it, need, it needed three or four Cal players to take him down. And then on top of that, I brought this up as one of my keys last week, was to contain Max Duggan in the pocket uh, or at least limit his runs. And it kind of did, but he still had 71 yards and a touchdown. And when it mattered, um, Duggan was converting third downs. He was getting he was getting the first downs when they needed it with his legs. And he was breaking tackles, too. It's not like he's the type of dual-threat quarterback that's going to slide when he gets the yards he wants. He's going to lower his shoulder. And, you know, he was kind of embarrassing a couple, a couple Cal defenders. And it was really... A big issue throughout the entire game was was containing this run, and uh, we'll talk about this later. But Sacramento State has that same type of duel where their quarterback can take off at any given moment. So, so that's concerning. But I, th I thought the defense seemed like they were playing well in the first half. Obviously, Daniel Scott was a monster. That um, pick six, and then a couple incredible plays before that. Um, but overall, just things weren't weren't coming together. And um, I think it's – I really want to jump back to the offense because, uh, for me, that was e easily one of the offensive games I've seen Cal played over the past four seasons, and they absolutely did enough to win, which is very rare to say. But the offense did enough to win. And they put up 442 yards of total offense. And for context, Cal averaged 320 total yards per game in 2020. 329 in 2019 and 343 in 2018. So just hitting the 400 mark is an accomplishment alone or accomplishment in, in itself. But doing that against TCU is one of the strongest defenses in the country. And Gary Patterson is known as 
one of the best defensive minded head coaches in the country. Uh, that says a lot about Belton Musgrave. I thought he called an incredible game. There were some maybe questionable decisions. I think uh, we all kind of noticed how often Cal was taking deep shots, especially compared to the first game against Nevada. But there were a couple of like third and one, third and two, third and three situations where Garbers was just unloading 20, 30 yards down the field. And I think those were the only times when I was really questioning Musgrave's play calling that game. But even that's a good problem to have for a team that refused to throw it more than like five yards down the field in the first game of the season. So um, I was glad to see that. And like you said, uh, there were receivers standing out. I mean, Trevon Clark had multiple instances where he had like five yards of separation of DB, which is, which is very rare. But um, uh, I, I thought it was a huge game for Garbers too. I know I texted you that uh, Garbers was looking like the Ole Miss Garbers, which, um, you know, the game didn't turn out like how the Ole Miss game turned out. But, but for me, Garbers, again, with the entire offense, absolutely did enough to win. Definitely. And, and Garbers had 235 passing yards in the first half. So that even, you know, puts it even into more context just how well um, Cal's offense was doing in the first half throughout the whole game, really. Um, the, the offense will we'll critique the offense, but at the end of the day, when you score 32 points on the road against a TCU defense, you should expect to win. Um, and I think, you know, it'll come, it comes down to those missed PATs, those missed two point conversions. Um, but at the end of the day, when you score uh, what, what should have been really 34 points um, away on the road against TCU, you should expect to win. Um, so, the defense, you know, really blew it this time around. Um, but, but you know, to, to criticize the offense a little bit, um, there were, like you said, there were a few instances on third and short um, where Musgrave was calling big passing plays. Um, and you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. There were, you know, more instances than not where um, going for it uh, or or taking those deep shots on third and two, third and one actually worked. Um, and so we're going to fixate, of course, on those very few instances where it didn't work. Right. Um, but but it is questionable. Certainly, when you when you have O line that's uh, that's healthy right now, everyone's healthy. Uh, it seemed to be clicking uh, in the Nevada game. Um, why you're not just you know alternating back and forth using the running game? And I think TCU, you, you see that in time of possession, they had 81 plays total plays to Cal's 54. Um, yep. And when the defense is on the field for that long, just getting, you know, you know, torn apart, um, play after play, um, it, it's hard. It's hard to to sustain that. Um, so I, that's where I do think the fatigue came in. Uh, the heat certainly didn't help. Um, and Cal just like like Peter Sermon said, um, the defensive coordinator said on Wednesday in a press conference, you know, we just didn't get off the field a lot of times on third down. Uh, Duggan would scramble. Um, Evans would push for a few extra yards and get a first down and Cal just couldn't get off the field. So it's, it's in those third down situations that Cal really needs to capitalize, uh, and, and get off the field. Yeah. I thought third down was definitely a weakness on both sides of the ball. The offense was only five of 13 on third down. And, um, like you said, I think they should have stuck with the run game a bit more. I mean, they had another incredible game. He's still averaging over five yards per carry. He had a couple touchdowns and, um, I'm also surprised at how little work Christopher Brooks and Marcel Dancy are getting. Um, but also, there's no reason to stop feeding Damian Moore when he's playing that well. So I see both sides of the coin. But yeah, to give some credit to the offensive line as well, I mean, I think they played fantastic with Moore running like that. And um, I think the reason why Garbers took so many deep shots is because he had the time to sit in the pocket and wait for those plays to develop. And that's, that's thanks to the offensive line. So um, also, a very interesting stat. Um, I know commentators and fans like to talk about how experienced Garbers is, being his fourth year starting. But this, I mean, says a lot more about how bad Cal has been. But this was only his third career game hitting 300 passing yards, which is kind of insane for a four year starter. So um, hopefully, there's more to come on that. But I mean, dude, being able to do that against the team, that's something that 
it's a big deal because they're on paper probably I would say the second toughest defense Cal will play this year or third. Maybe Oregon and UW above that, but I mean UW hasn't looked good. I think Oregon's the only defense that's tougher than TCU. I mean they have all conference players all across that roster. I mean, you know, to to be fair to Washington, you know, they did only allow 13 points to Montana. So, you know, really, really well done there. Um, they'll be definitely a tough team in the defense. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. Um, the offense is it, – it was, it was a transformation from the Nevada game um, where Chase Garbers had almost no big plays. I think his longest play was to Jeremiah Hunter in the first quarter, 28 yards. Um, and – this game, he had quite a few passes over 50 yards. Um, I think the biggest passing play of his career came to came to Clark and that second um, long reception of his, of the game. Um, so, so offense obviously has taken a step forward. Defense, for some reason or or another, just couldn't contain the run. Um, um, so that'll be something to look out for for sure. Yeah, and that's a good segue into our next topic because um, you know in the trend so far, two games into the season. Um, the defense hasn't looked all too great, and um, some unfortunate news is that Coin Dang, um, Cal's one of the, Cal's captains for this season, potential NFL hopeful and just star player all around, um, he left with an injury. And obviously, Coach Wilcox doesn't really reveal anything about injuries, but there's some good news and some bad news. Um, the good news is that Wilcox said. He was doubtful to play against Sacramento State this weekend, but they, they were holding out a tiny bit of hope. So obviously that means this isn't hopefully a season-ending injury because you never – the only reason I say hopefully is because the bad news is that Wilcox said Coyne got multiple opinions on the injury, which means it's probably not a clear-cut injury. Um, maybe they don't really know what's going on, but Wilcox did say there has not yet been a clear diagnosis. So it's yet to be seen – how long he's out, I highly, highly doubt he plays against Sacramento State if they haven't already ruled him out. I mean, there's no reason to. There should be a game where Cal doesn't need to deploy all of their best players to win. But, um, you know, Coin's going to want to get back as fast as he can, obviously. But there, there's a lot bigger issues this defense has to worry about. And um, one thing I want to start with is going back to – Coach Wilcox's decision to pick, essentially pick Peter Sermon over Tim DeRuiter as defensive coordinator. And Jasper and I had an episode about this way back when they just announced that because we didn't see any reason why Wilcox made that decision. Um, basically, it was Tim DeRuiter used to be Cal's defensive coordinator, and Peter Sermon was the inside linebackers coach and assistant head coach or something. But basically, Wilcox promoted Sermon, gave him the play calling duties, and demoted Tim DeRuiter to co-defensive coordinator and outside linebackers coach. And that confused a lot of us because it happened right after 2019. And in both 2018 and 2019, Cal had an elite defense in the Pac-12. One of the best, Tim DeRuiter was doing a phenomenal job. Um, but after Wilcox demoted him for some reason, um, DeRuiter understandably left for a place where he could be the main defensive coordinator, which, I mean, you can't fault him for that. Um, he was also a super nice guy. I mean, anytime we would interview him, he was always happy to talk to us. Um, just a great guy all around. And um, while Cal is allowing 34 points to TSU, DeRuiter is leading Oregon's defense to a massive away upset win over Ohio State. So if that isn't classic Cal, just letting a coach slip like that, because who knows what reason. But, I mean... He's doing fantastic things over at Oregon, and I still just don't really understand that move. To be honest, I don't even know why I'm bringing this up because there's nothing Cal can do about it now. But, I mean, it just doesn't seem like this Sermon-Wilcox combination is working nearly as well as DeRuiter was for Cal. Right, and and I guess what I don't understand is why uh, you know you're switching up something that was working. Um, it's not. Ex it's not like yeah. this is hindsight. Where, um, oh, wait, now we've discovered that Tim DeRuiter was a was a great defensive coordinator who can apparently beat Ohio State's offense. Um, you know, I, I think Wilcox knew this. Um, 
we can only speculate what's going on there. Um, but yeah, it, it is disappointing. Um, especially, and, and, you know, we're only going to make, bring this stuff up when Cal gives up 34 points to, to TCU. Um, right. You know, they only allowed 22 to Nevada. It wasn't a terrible defensive showing. It wasn't great. Um, but it wasn't something, it wasn't a point of concern after that week one. Um, so, you know, hindsight, you know, is 2020 and that sort of stuff. Um, how, how they move forward now um, will be interesting. I know Wilcox mentioned in a press conference on Wednesday um, that Marquez Bimage, the grad transfer from Texas, and then Braxton Croto um, will be taking snaps in place of uh, Coin Dang. Uh, they might mix in Patu or in Patu, the, the redshirt sophomore, sparingly. Um, they said he's, you know, he's great in, in third down situations, getting to the quarterback, but he still needs a little work in those uh, first and second down situations. So they might use him situationally is what he said, um, but it'll mostly be Bimage, Bimage and Croto um, filling in for Dang. Um, and, and I honestly don't think against Sacramento State this will be too much of an issue. Um, you know, Sacramento State has some great playmakers, um, but it's an FCS school. Um, I don't want to us underestimate them. Uh, you know, this may come back and um, haunt us um, if we start saying Sacramento State's an easy win. But I really don't think uh, Dang's absence is going to make a huge difference here. Right, and yeah, we'll we'll see how long that absence lasts for. But I think um, it has up over the the first two games of the season that um, there isn't quite the chemistry there. I mean, obviously. Uh, the execution of actually making a tackle hasn't been there. But I think, you know, seeing the way some of Cal's inside linebackers of the past have played together, um, that's not really there. And obviously, the inside linebacker position already had a bunch of young faces rotating in. Um, and now outside linebackers, it's going to be those younger guys, um, guys lower on the depth chart having to rotate in with Dang out. And, um, you know, it might hopefully – it's just taking some time for them to get that continuity and chemistry going before, you know, they can kind of learn how each other play and be able to know what spots to be in. But um, for now, it's it's definitely apparent that, that Cal has a lot of uh, a lot of experience that they need to develop. But um, there has there have been a lot of bright spots on the defense. I mean, Cam Good was an absolute monster against TCU. Way kind of expected. I thought honestly, both he had a fantastic game. Uh, he did have two pretty big penalties. I thought the first one was a very, very weak call, the roughing the pass there or whatever they called on the on the option. Um, and then even the horse collar tackle looked like he grabbed the jersey. I uh, couldn't really tell. But um, who's someone that you you can see as kind of that secondary uh, playmaker with, with good? kind of leading the force. Who's someone that you think Cal is going to depend on to make those impact plays moving forward? Yeah, I, I think uh, in the secondary, it's got to be Chikosia Nuzio. Um, you know, he's he's someone who definitely needs to start stepping up, and that's something that Wilcox acknowledged um, this past Wednesday. You know, uh, there have been a few plays, especially I, I can't remember which, uh, which play exactly, but he gave up a touchdown pass uh, in the TCU game. Yeah. Um, and, and He's had a rough start. He definitely has. When Wilcox brought that up, you know, he acknowledged that and he said, you know, those are plays that that we expect Chiggy to make, and and they're plays that he expects himself to make. Um, so the talent and the experience are there. Um, why it's not clicking right now, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I, I do see him as stepping up at some point in this season. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but but the secondary is definitely some a, a place of, of concern. Is you know, like you said, those uh, in the fourth quarter, especially um, Cal had a terrible time trying to make open field tackles. Um, Zach Evans uh, touchdown run. You just kind of like brush past a couple. I can't remember who the inside linebacker was or who the who the defensive back was. But, you know, just totally breaking a few tackles, just missed tackles. Um but I definitely think that the secondary needs to step up and start making those tackles. And then even at even at the uh, um, on the D line, you have to start stopping the run at the point of attack. Um, you know, with Dang out now, it's clear. It's right. It's clear that the team is missing Brett Johnson heavily right now. Right, right. And I think 
um, just getting there and stopping the run before it gets to the linebackers um, will be helpful. Um, you know, just limiting that so that open field tackles aren't as much of an issue. Um, so that's definitely somewhere where Cal can, Cal can improve. Yeah, and it, this should be – this upcoming game against Sac State should be a game where the defense can get back on track. Um, they're kind of in need of a bit of a confidence booster right now. Um, you know, hopefully there's going to be some forced turnovers and the defense will just start hyping each other up. But uh, they, re they really need to, you know, start getting on the same page with only one game left until conference play. Um, but, yeah, that's a, that's a good segue into our final topic, uh, taking a look at Sacramento State and – I know this uh, This is a contentious topic within um, the Daily Cal. I was reading your guys' shoot-around. Um, is Sacramento State a must-win game, and do you think it's a guaranteed win? Yeah, so um, in our kind of shoot-around article, um, the, the question that was posed was, is Sacramento State a do-or-die game? Um, and it's an important game for sure, um, but – do or die when you of, don't have any wins when you don't have any wins every game's but at that point you every right. game's important yeah exactly when you're owing to uh every game is a do or die game because you know that's just you have to win it you're some just dead point. already you're already right. dead so like there's <laughs> more thing left is to do exactly um and i i think because cal's expectations coming into the season were um, challenging for a Pac-12 championship appearance, uh, challenging for a bigger bowl game, going nine and three. Um, if, if those are the expectations, that this is not a do or die game because I think um, those goals can um, are, are just not feasible. Um, if you're losing to, to Nevada at home and then TCU, you know, giving up 34 points to TCU, um, you know, it, it's just not a football team that's going to go nine and three and actually achieve those goals this year. Um, it is an important game, at least for the future of the program. Um, so today, actually yesterday, Jaden Ott, uh, 2020 class of 22, 2022 running back, four star running back, um, ranked by rivals is like the 16th best running back in the class. Um, he, he decommitted from Cal. Um, and, he has a whole list of offers. He's got Oregon, Nebraska, Georgia, Arizona State. He can pretty much go anywhere he wants. Um, and so to keep recruits like that coming in, Wilcox has been recruiting a lot better. Um, but to keep recruits like that coming in, you can't start a season 0-3, and you definitely can't lose at home to Sac State. Um, so this is a, it's a must-win game. It's not uh, a do-or-die game in the context of Cal's season. Um, that, you know, that, that train's already kind of, you know, left the station. Yeah, and let alone recruits. If Cal loses this game, I mean, there's no hope for fans coming back. I don't, I don't even know if there's going to be anywhere close to the amount of fans at this game as there was for the Nevada game, the opener. Um, but, I mean, no one's coming back. Like, <laughs> they're, they're there to see at least entertaining football, and losing to Sac State would not be entertaining. Um, but yeah, I mean, FCS teams are supposed to lose to FBS, FBS teams, but we've seen that narrative broken early this season. I mean, you said Montana beating UW, Jacksonville State beat FSU. So um, it's not a team, or sorry, it's not a game that you can just sleep on and the team will tell that to you themselves. But, but just to, to be objective, Sac State has never beat a Pac-12 team. Uh, they did have a relatively close game with ASU in 2019. Um, but the season before that, they got shut out and whooped by UW. So, um, you know, with that being said, I 100% expect Cal to win this game uh, just because any reasonable college football fan should probably have that expectation as well. I believe Cal's favored by, um, like, high 20s in points. So most people, Vegas, is expecting um, a blowout. And I think that that's very fair. Uh, but a little about Sac State, it's kind of hard to scout teams like this, FCS teams, just because you never see them just, like, scrolling through the TV. I mean, 
it's hard to even find YouTube highlights of these teams, but um, their head coach, Troy Taylor, I didn't know this. He, he was a four-year starter at Cal, and he has the second most passing yards behind Jared Goff. So uh, definitely going to be a bit of a homecoming. I'm sure they'll do some type of tribute for him on the big screen. But um, Sac State's a weird case because they didn't play in 2020. So um, apart from their first couple of games, they they had a really good season in 2019. They made the FCS playoffs, and um, they're expected to be back being Big Sky contenders this year. But, I mean, they just haven't played a lot of football recently. And that kind of showed last week against Northern Iowa. Uh, they committed five turnovers, and like I was saying, that's going to be a fantastic opportunity to get this Cal defense back on track and hopefully fo- uh, force some more turnovers. Right, and I, yeah, Ashro O'Hara threw three, uh, three interceptions, um, so he's he's definitely mistake prone. Um, I, you know, like you said, this is this is a game for Cal to to build some confidence. Um, it's. It's a game where we'll really just be looking forward to to, to the week after, um, you know, to see how how Cal fares in a, against an actual, uh, you know, a, an opponent at our level. Um, but but it's definitely not a game that you can overlook. And and I'm sure after going 0 and 2, uh, the Cal coaching staff is um, very concerned about this game. Um, so so uh, you know, it'll it'll be. I think a confidence booster. I don't see uh, Sacramento State getting close, um, but you know there there are some skilled players on on Sac State. Elijah Dotson is a um, they can flex him out. Uh, they're running back. I think he has twenty five all twenty five hundred all purpose yards at Sac State so far. Um, Asher O'Hara can use his legs, and uh, as we've seen, Cal struggles against quarterbacks who can get out of the pocket and scramble and make things happen. Um, so, um, definitely not a team to sleep on, but I, I'm confident that Cal can, can get it done. Yeah. And, uh, before we wrap up, uh, as we always do a couple quick keys, uh, for me, one thing I really want to see is Cal keep the trend from last week of being aggressive on offense. I mean, if you're taking that many vertical shots against TCU, who's known to have a fantastic secondary, I mean, Cal was throwing deep on them all night or all day long. Um, you have to just keep taking those shots against Sac State because, I mean, unless they're playing, you know, too high safety all the time, those are going to be open more often than they're not. So I, I would love to see Chase Garbers continue, you know, getting those 20, 30 yard balls um, because that's something that, one, gets the fans excited, obviously. But two, I mean, Cal's offense has proven to be a lot more effective when the vertical passing game opens um, and more can can use those gaps once the defense starts respecting the pass. Yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, my key to the game is, um, is the secondary has to play uh, like a Pac-12 school playing against an FCS school. So the secondary really needs to lock in in this game, um, give the D-line time to get to O'Hara, um, because, you know, as we've seen uh, against TCU, especially towards the end of the game, when I think the fatigue started setting in, uh, the D-line had a, had a hard time um, getting, and they didn't have enough time to, to get to um, get to Duggan. Um, so, you know, re- a really solid performance from Cal's secondary, um, I think will, will be, um, you know, it'll, it'll transform Cal's defense. Um, it'll, it'll definitely help the D-line. Um, a lot to give them some more time. Yes, uh, I completely agree. And I think um, doing that will also help Cal's third down defense, which um, hopefully will improve compared to last week. TCU went 10 for 18 on third down, um, some of which were third and long. So you uh, expect But uh, really quickly, um, I'll give my score prediction. I, I haven't really been close on any yet, but uh, I'm going to go Cal 41. Sac State, seventeen. I think. I think with O'Hara's dual threat nature, they they could put up a respectable amount of points on offense. Okay. Yeah. And I don't remember what my prediction is or what I what I, what's going to be printed in the paper. Check the uh, paper tomorrow. Check the paper Need tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'll be out there live hawking. Um, I'm I'm going to go with thirty four fourteen Cal. 
All right. Well, there you have it. We will hopefully be back next week um, talking about Cal's first win of the season. But if being a Cal fan has taught you anything, never have any expectations, let alone hope. So 